On November 21st, 1991, Shigeru Miyamoto produced the critically acclaimed Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Ranking as one of the top Super Nintendo games ever created, expectations were sky high for the next home console installment. Little did fans know they would have to wait over six years to satisfy that hunger. Ocarina of Time had a long and complicated development cycle, so get comfortable and prepare to learn how The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time came to be. In 1992, development began for a polygon-based Zelda 2 remake for the Super Famicom. Yoshiaki Kazumi, who had worked on prior Zelda games, and Miyamoto wanted to make a Zelda game heavily based on sword fighting in the same way that Zelda 2 was, only this time they wanted to use a three-dimensional graphics style, something that few Super Nintendo games ever utilized. This was a short-lived project though. Because of the limitations of the Super Nintendo, the sword fighting they desired to make could not be achieved, thus the project was dropped. It was most likely because right around the corner, a new console was approaching. In 1993, the news was spreading that Nintendo teamed up with Silicon Graphics to produce a new home video game console dubbed Project Reality. This console was officially announced on November 14, 1994 at the Shoshinkai Software Exhibition in Japan. At the time, the capabilities of the console were being unveiled, but no playable games were on display. In early 1995, development for the next generation Zelda game would finally begin. On November 22nd of that year, at the Shoshinkai Exhibition in Japan, Project Reality was now referred to as the Nintendo Ultra 64. Along with this new name announcement, it began having some of its first game announcements as well. Out of all these games, two major ones were confirmed. The first was Mario 64. This was to be the killer app on the N64. It looked to be in a nearly finished state at the exhibition and tons of gameplay was being shown. Then, there was Zelda 64. This was to be the killer app of the also newly announced Nintendo 64 disk drive. The Nintendo 64 disk drive, which was also known as the 64DD, was an add-on peripheral that expanded the space on an N64 cartridge. It also had the ability to add content to existing Nintendo 64 games with its 64 megabyte magneto optical discs. And it promised many other things that got people very excited about this addition to the Nintendo 64. Here's the trailer that was shown at the exhibition, and this is what I've dubbed Stage 1 of Ocarina of Time's development. It's clear that this was just a tech demo running off the Nintendo 64 hardware and that no game was created yet, nor was it running off the 64DD. Nintendo has become famous for using this technique to promote their upcoming systems and is still used today. A similar demo was shown on the GameCube and more recently the Wii U. Demos such as these have never been related to the final product of the games being portrayed in them, so what happened next would be no surprise. In 1996, Zelda 64 development had finally begun on the Mario 64 engine. After Takao Shimizu created the Nintendo 64 tech demo for the exhibition, he then left the team and was replaced by Koizumi. Koizumi joined Jinikita, who worked on character design, and Toru Usawa, who was a Nintendo 64 hardware specialist. Koizumi was in charge of various jobs such as camera design, environments, items, and very importantly, creating the character model for Link. This three-man team was all Nintendo had to begin creating the next installment of the Zelda series on the new Nintendo 64 platform. Shortly after Koizumi joined the Zelda team, he approached Miyamoto on how he wanted to create the game. Miyamoto suggested that the game be created in a first-person perspective. He only wanted Link to appear when a battle was engaged. When this happened, the camera would switch to a side perspective and Link would fight from a third-person view, and then switch back when the battle was finished. Koizumi was appalled by this idea and did not even want to test it out. Since he was creating the character model for Link, he wanted it to be shown as much as possible during the game. Despite this, the first person view was actually implemented, but only for a short amount of time. It was deemed unimpressive from a visual standpoint, so they continued making the game in a third person perspective. On November 24th, 1996, Shoshinkai was once again around to show off Nintendo's best. For the first time, in-game footage of Zelda 64 was being showcased, and this is the trailer that was displayed. Nintendo 64 
Shortly after the exhibition ended, various publications received images from the build shown at Shoshenkai, and this is what I've dubbed Stage 2 of Ocarina of Time's development. This build was developed around the 64DD, and it hardly resembles the Zelda we know today. As you can see, Link looks nothing like his demonstration model and barely resembles his Ocarina of Time counterpart, but Link's appearance is only the start of these drastic changes. The HUD resembles earlier Zeldas in the sense that only two items can be equipped at any time. It's possible that the lack of item slots is because the C buttons may have been used as camera controls at this time, since a sophisticated camera wasn't implemented yet. Link's in what's speculated to be the main town, which at this point was in full 3D, and it seems that the changing of time was reflected here, judging from the noon, day, and night sequences seen in the screenshots. And it looked pretty massive, especially compared to the Hyrule Marketplace in the final version of Ocarina of Time. Along with this new town, a mystery reoccurring character appears, not only here, but in the very early version of Lake Hylaea as well. Her model and animation data were found within Ocarina of Time, but her format was so old that it was actually incompatible with the final version of the game so her data had to be converted into a compatible format to even be viewable within the game's engine. Fans have named this character Arya, but very little is known about her. One mechanic that this early version of the game has that would be removed later on is manual jumping. At this point, jumping was not automatic and any time you wanted Link to jump, you would need to press a button. Another slight mechanic change would be that Link's bow and arrow would be handled in a third person view, as it seems that no first person view had been implemented for this yet. Almost every enemy shown had a major overhaul as well, as none of these enemies look the same in the final version. Here's some images of them being compared to their counterparts. On an unrelated note, the Staffo shield looks similar to the shield Link had in his tech demo minus the textures. All of the areas being shown now were either discarded or remade, and almost nothing is known about these places, but there is speculation. This area is believed to be an early version of the Lost Woods. Unlike the final version of the Lost Woods, Link would be able to walk around freely and there would be much less of a maze aspect to it. Which is ironic, considering this area was originally called the Maze Woods. And this area looks to be a very early version of the Dodongo's Cavern. Some of these areas are still accessible in the debug version of the game, but they have no relation to the final build. Some other notable differences would be that Link's shield went through some minor changes as well. You can see that the later shield is a lot more similar to Link's final shield. Also, you may have noticed that the shield has a number under its picture. Perhaps this was an early version of a shield that could possibly break after too much use, or it may have just been a placeholder for items that had limited use. And here you can see that Link is running with the shield out in front of him even though his sword isn't drawn, and in the final version of the game, Link doesn't do this. One very important transition that this build had was the addition of Navi. Navi was named after her sole purpose which was to navigate Link to chosen targets. Navi replaced what used to be a basic targeting marker, and later on grew to become a very important part of the story. One incredibly speculated area was caused by the distribution of this image, and to this day prompts people to believe that the Triforce was once an obtainable item and still is today. But chances are that this whole scene was a pre-rendered segment and that it never actually ran on Nintendo 64 hardware. This is because the shadows seen in the video and in screenshots depicting this video are extremely detailed. This is an issue because all of Link's other shadows seen are nowhere near as detailed as these ones. At the time, the game was heavily based on the Mario 64 engine, so such advanced lighting effects so early on are hard to fathom. Especially when these detailed effects are never seen again in the game, even in the final build. Also, this is the only early scene that lacks any kind of HUD. Now, that's not to say that it's impossible that this scene was rendered on a Nintendo 64, but it seems very out of place considering all these things. And that covers most of the notable topics in this build. It wouldn't be until early 1997 we would hear any more news about the game's progress. One of these major announcements would be on March 7th, and it was that the game was being moved from the 64DD and being solely developed on the Nintendo 64 platform as a single cartridge game. It wasn't until E3 that we would see any gameplay, and here's some of the footage that was taken there.
There were also various promo tapes given away that had very early footage on them. The following is from a French promo VHS. And this promo tape is from Germany, but it only includes a few new scenes. Aside from these videos, there are some very interesting pictures that came out around this time as well, and they coincide with this build of the game. The first of these pictures show off an area that's believed to be the Sky Temple, which is one of the many supposed removed temples from the game. In this picture, you can see that the Deku Tree is still alive even though Link is an adult. Young Link wasn't planned to be in the game at this point, and it's unclear of how this would have affected the main story of the game, but it's known that his integration wasn't until much later in the game's development. This picture is from an unknown area. And here's two more pictures. One is from an early version of the graveyard, and the other is from an early version of the desert. Here are some of the first screenshots that we've seen that are inside Ganon's castle. Although it's not related to the current build, Miyamoto originally thought that the whole game may take place solely within Ganon's castle. Another change from this version are things like the new HUD, and that the C buttons are being utilized for items now, versus prior versions where only the A and B buttons were being used for this. And there were a few other pictures that came out around this time as well, but there's nothing too interesting about them. And that about wraps it up for this build. It wouldn't be until late 1997 that the game would feature some major revamps. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for part 2 where we'll look at the many changes that led to the final version of the game.